everyone. Welcome to the Odds on Favorites podcast, where we're talking sports entertainment and sports entertainment, all with an eye on the bottom line. I'm Drew Goldfarb, joined by Rick Rockwell and Taylor Smith. We don't like wasting time here, so let's jump right on in with news and notes, where we're taking a closer look at the biggest news of the week. This week, we begin with the Kentucky Derby and a crazy finish and post-race challenge review and disqualification. Taylor, what are your thoughts on how the Derby turned out? I thought it was kind of lame. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, the horse that won was the best horse in the race. And the fact that they were able to challenge and they reviewed it for a long time. It took like half an hour, it seemed, uh, to review the result. And just to have it overturned on technicality like that. Like, I get that the rules are the way they are. And the way, you know, that if that happened in a random race at Santa Anita, they'd probably overturn it the same way. So the rules should apply. But I don't know. It's just kind of brutal. It's brutal for the winning horse because it's kind of like you didn't really win. You just won on the technicality. It's like the ultimate bad beat, though, if you bet on uh, what was the horse's name that <laughs> got disqualified? I'm uh, completely blanking on that. Maximum security. Maximum security. Yeah. I don't know. Like, if you bet on that and he wins and then you lose on a technicality like that, I cannot imagine a worse loss. Um, but on the flip side, if you bet on country horse, country house, <laughs> and he comes out of nowhere to win at one, or was it 50 to one, something like that? I don't know. The whole thing just seemed lame, and now neither of them is running in the Preakness. So there's no real intrigue left at all. Like, the whole thing is just a complete waste of time. You know, what would be worse is if one of the horses that was going to win fell and broke his leg and they had to shoot it on the track. That could have been worse, Taylor. With that said, okay. this was exciting, right? We got controversy. We got drama. We've got one horse thinking he won, the other horse coming out winning. That was probably the best Kentucky Derby I've seen in a long time. Forget the two minutes of racing. It was the 30 minutes afterwards and the days following of people crying and complaining, filing appeals. That's what makes entertainment, at least for this guy. I don't feel sorry at all. We had a prop last week that was who will the winning jockey think first? And I said God was a good value at plus 300, and he did thank God first, but he wound up not being the winning jockey. So I guess we lose that bet too. Like, it's just a mess all around. I can't imagine how they would sort that out if you bet on things like that. I hope that anybody who had maximum security was like really quick to the window just to, you know, yeah. down there, you know, get the, get paid on your ticket while he, the, that horse was still the winner. I, I mean, that was yeah, a, get out while you can. I'd be sitting right at the window. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, uh, I don't have an issue with rules kicking into effect. Obviously I, it, it, this kind of like my thing with review and, you know, the big four sports, it's, the, the time it takes, if it's not an easy thing to figure out, if it's not something that you can do in less time than the, t than the play took, uh, then it's not something that actually happened. I mean, it's, you know, that's the thing is that when you talk about the, the fact that it took as long as it did for a two minute race, that's where the issue, the only issue I really have with it is, is that if you can't disqualify a horse that just ran a two minute race within two minutes after, after watching it. I mean, you could literally rewatch the entire race in 50% speed in four minutes. <laughs> so if you can't do that and then figure out that that horse should have been disqualified then, at that point, it's, it's kind of like a, when the NFL first did their challenges, they had a, a time limit. And this has never been an issue before in the Kentucky Derby, may never be an issue again in the Kentucky Derby. So, you know, making a rule change for this would seem kind of dumb, but uh, you know, it just the, the idea of like, okay, it, it, within five minutes of a two minute race ending, I think you should pretty much know who the winner is. I don't think that they would review a photo finish for 30 minutes. I don't think that like, they're literally going to take the photos, email it to NASA, wait 20 minutes, get the photo back and be like, Oh, we have a winner. We have gone down, you know, we, we've uh, zoomed in enhanced and figured out who the winner, you know? So I, I, you know, that's the only issue I really have with it. It's a weird situation. It's a weird finish. It kind of felt like someone was uh, watching, you know, the Sharks Golden Knights series in game seven and was like, oh, you think you can get people talking about the officiating? Hold my beer. Uh, but, you know, aside from that, it, I don't have an issue with anything other than the time it took. That's it's really kind of like in baseball when you have a play at a base and a guy's foot comes off the base for a fraction of a second and the guy still has the tag on him and it takes 
15 minutes for the umpires to review right. it. It's like, that's not really the spirit of the whole thing. That's just no. like, I don't if know. it could be worse, they could give everyone in the Kentucky Derby a participation trophy. So the, the two ways that that could have been worse, according to Rick Rockwell, is they could have shot a horse on the track or given yeah. everyone a participation trophy. There you go. The guy wearing the Dark Knight shirt to make things a little dark. I'm back. <laughs> well, let's move to the NBA really quick, where we've had one team advance at the time of this taping, and that is the Milwaukee Bucks. Milwaukee defeated Boston in five games to become the first team to punch their ticket to the conference finals. And with Golden State not exactly running away from either team they've played so far, possible injury issues as well, and every other series sitting at 2-2 at at least one point, should people be rushing to bet on the Bucks? Milwaukee currently minus 200 to win the East, plus 250 to win the NBA championship. Rick, we're going to go to you first. How can you make this one as, as dark as you made the horse racing one? <laughs> you, <laughs> I can't do that here because I'm not going to talk about shooting anybody on an NBA court. <laughs> But uh, from there, we're going to go to the fact that, you know what, I think it's time to start considering Milwaukee as a value bet. If you can get them for plus 250 or higher in the uh, winning the NBA championship, I don't like the odds for the East. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of uh, value in that bet. But for me, it's still Golden State all the way. Even with Kevin Durant banged up, if he doesn't play a game or two or however long it is, if he comes back, Golden State's still going to win it all if he even misses any time. Uh, they're still the best team. They're going to put away Houston. Houston couldn't even take out Golden State after Durant went out. Um, the Warriors are the best team. And if you bet on anything other than the Warriors, then I would say Milwaukee, depending on what their odds are for uh, winning the championship, would be probably the best value you can still find right now. Um, no other team really offers any good return in my opinion. Yeah, minus 200 to win the East is not that appealing. They're either playing Toronto or Philly. Um, I think it'll be Toronto, and I think they'll probably beat Toronto, even though I think that should probably be a six- or seven-game series too. Um, you know, plus 250 to win the title is legit, especially if Durant happens to be injured worse than it seems right now. They called it a calf strain last night, but it looked pretty brutal at the time, and I wouldn't be surprised if that was just a precautionary thing. Um, Golden State could still easily lose this series, which would put everything in play. So Milwaukee at plus 250, they're probably the best team left that's not Golden State. I think that's pretty good value. Uh, they match up pretty well. They have better depth than Golden State. Obviously not as much star power, but if Durant's injured, then all bets are off, and I think you should jump on that while you can. Um, plus two, It's only going to go down, I think, from here. So plus 250 is probably <coughs> as good as you're going to get. Yeah, I, uh, I guess if you're going to be looking for someone other than Golden State, that's your option. It's, uh, it would have been better to have picked them earlier when the, the odds were – when Golden State was so heavily favored to win the NBA championship. But, uh, I mean, I think that it, in my eyes, it's more of a situation where this is now more reassuring. If you are someone who bet on Milwaukee to either win the East or to win the entire NBA title before – uh, the playoffs started, or maybe even just before this round. But I, if you weren't flocking to Milwaukee, you know, a week and a half ago, uh, or three weeks ago, I, you know, at this point, I, I don't know if the odds are such that you'd be like desperate. I think that it's good if you've wagered on them already. I think that the, the way they've uh, played has been very reassuring. But yeah, it's, it's you would have gotten better odds a week ago. Uh, these are the best you're going to get on them. Uh, and I agree with Taylor. I think they're going to win the East at this point, Toronto or Philly. Uh, I think Milwaukee is going to go to the NBA championship. So, you know, uh, minus 200, eh. plus 250 is interesting. Uh, only if, uh, you know, the, the injury issues to Golden State are, like you guys were saying, worse than – what they're trying to make it out to be at the moment. Uh, let's go on to Jeopardy, because Jeopardy's in the middle of the 2019 Teachers Tournament, which means a breather between episodes that feature James Holtzauer. Those episodes resume after next week. Right now, Holtzauer sits just shy of $1.7 million in winnings, averaging over $76,000 per show during his 22-game winning streak. Ken Jennings' record for consecutive wins is 74. Total winnings during that streak – $2,522,700. Brad Rutter holds the lifetime winnings record for the show 
at a little under $4.7 million. Rick, how many more records could fall to Holtzauer before someone hands him a loss? What is just one? Um, like I said a couple weeks ago, I thought he was going to break the, the money record for uh, just regular shows, not including the tournaments. So he would break um, the $2.5 million, and he's well on his way for that. But he's still got to win another 50-plus games to break the record of 74. I just don't see that happen. He's only the second person to break uh, 20. Um, I don't see it happening at all. And then when you get to Rudder's record of over $4 million, it's hard to imagine that that would fall in this time. But if he continues this streak and he continues to go, there's a chance that he can get to Rudder before he gets to the 74 mark. So I'm going to say one for now, just the $2.4 million. If he's still around in, you know, 35, 40 shows streak, then I'm going to say he has a good shot at breaking the, the $4 million Rudder's record. Yeah, it's just the way he plays. He's super aggressive with going for the, uh, you know, the highest values on the board to try and, you know, generate as much as he can by the time he gets to the daily double. Uh, like you said, the 74, I think, straight wins is – it's not impossible, but it seems pretty unlikely just because he has so long to go. And I imagine between now and then someone has to step up and actually beat him. So just the way he plays all aggressively, you know, he made over $100,000 – five times already, which no one had ever done before in a single episode. I think he can get to the winnings record, but the consecutive win streak, it's kind of like the, the Cal Ripken streak. It's kind of like, you know, that's a streak that someone did one time that no one will ever come close to again. Um, so I wouldn't be chasing the wins record there. So uh, just doing some quick uh, long division on it, it would, at the current pace that he's on, it would take about 61 wins for him to break Brad Rutter's all-time winnings record uh, at the pace he's on of about 70, of over 76,000. So I basically put 76 into the 4.7 million, uh, which is insane to think that essentially if he were to catch Jennings at 74, that he'd break 5 million, uh, which is ridiculous. Uh, Jennings record at 2.5, I mean, he would essentially double Jennings' winnings uh, in the same amount of time. Um, so I, I think it's more likely that he beats Rudders than that he beats the 74. I think it's incredibly likely that he breaks the 2.5 million. Uh, you know, the way that he plays, it is one of those things where if he had that off day, uh, that, you know, that's, it's, it'll be a crash and burn just because of the way that he risks where he's risking, He's, I forget what the number is. He's averaging something like $20,000 per double jeopardy wager. He's averaging, uh, he's like 95% efficient on both buzzing in and being correct with his uh, response. So he is unbelievably efficient and plays very, very, uh, you would say risky if he wasn't as good as he is um, at playing the show. He's because, aggressive. Uh, he's a gambler. He's aggressive. You know, before he even got on the show, uh, I read an interview how he was asking one of the uh, workers for Jeopardy how the buzzard worked. How, you know, how do you hit it? How do you hold it? Do you have to put a lot of pressure? So forth and so forth. I guess he got his answers. Yep. It, it, he kind of reminds me a bit of the guy who gamed the prices right way back when. When it comes to that, where it's not to the same extent where the guy like literally memorized a hundred thousand or or whatever it was a hundred and fifty prize values so that he could bid exactly correct when he finally got on the show. But the guy the guy did his research. He knew exactly how to buzz in, like you were saying. Uh, and the guy, I mean, the efficiency and the, basically figured out the way to be able to best both intimidate his opponents with the value of what he's wagering on all of these things. And also to maximize profitability in playing. It's unbelievably impressive what he's done. And uh, I, I think it's very likely that he breaks Jennings two and a half. I think that it's unlikely he gets to 75 games just because that is such an insane number when second place before him was 20. So we'll see. 
Uh, if anyone could do it, it's this guy. And if he does manage to catch Jennings, he'll also catch Rudder. Uh, and he'll do that well beforehand. He could basically fall about 15 games shy of Ken Jennings' win streak record and still break Brad Rudder's all-time winnings mark, which includes tournaments, which means that when this guy comes back for tournaments, it, it, uh, it, it boggles the mind what this guy's been able to do. Let, let's go into uh, where's your money going, because it's all about what we're most excited for in the coming days. Taylor, we're going to start with you. So what event or events or game or prop bet are you most excited to see and to wager on in the next few days? So I just kind of want to talk about the Champions League because I don't know if anyone's paid attention to soccer over the last couple of days, but it's been absolutely incredible. Uh, Liverpool were a three, they were three nil, three nil down uh, after the first game in Barcelona last week. They had to come back and score four goals to advance to the final of Champions League. They did that against a Barcelona team that's probably the best team in the world or, you know, top three right now. Um, so they're going to be in the final against Tottenham, who also staged a great comeback against Ajax during the week. So we have two English teams squaring off in the biggest European soccer game of the year, which hasn't happened in quite some time. Um, Liverpool minus 108 to win, Tottenham plus 277. Three days ago, you could have gotten Liverpool at plus 2200 to win Champions League. That's how long of a shot they were among the four teams left. Uh, now they're minus 108 favorites. Um, I would be taking that minus 108. I think as we get closer to the game itself, they're just going to become bigger favorites than they are now. Um, so I'd be going with that minus 108 on Liverpool to win Champions League. Oh, is it my turn? I, I fell asleep there when we're talking about soccer. Uh, I'm going to keep the European flavor going with Taylor here. Um, and we're going to the Tour of Italy. We're going cycling, Giro d'Italia. I'm pretty pumped up for this. It's the first big uh, Grand Tour of the year. Um, I know there's not as many cycling fans out there as there are soccer fans and what is that other game called? Golf fans. Um, but this is going to be a huge event. With Chris Froome not there, there's at least five or six top riders that could win this. Uh, media outlets, fans, or even cyclists are excited to see who's going to be left standing. It's the three-week war of attrition, guys. It's over 2,100, 2,200 miles of cycling throughout that stage, up and down, mountains, sprinting, you name it. Um, my money's going towards that. I wrote a complete betting guide on this. There's so many prop bets. There are head-to-head um, -head matchups. One of them I'll share a little bit later in the show, uh, outright winners. And then you've got the different classifications, young rider, king of the mountains, points, and then the GC. So there's so much in one of these tournaments. Um, you literally can bet on it for three straight weeks. You can make a lot of money. There's a lot of opportunities, some good value. And I'm pumped. I am fired up for that. I'm getting on my bike as soon as we're done with this show. I, I heard you say Grand Tour, and I got excited because I thought that Amazon had canceled the series after three seasons. But then you were talking about cycling, and I was back to being bummed that uh, Jeremy Clarkson and company are – doing specials only moving forward. Uh, let's get into spread and butter. It's a closer look at the weekend's biggest games and the betting spread. As usual, we're going to the NBA for the playoffs. A quick addition to spread and butter this week because only one game for us to talk about here because uh, that's between Houston and Golden State. Warriors won on Wednesday night, took a 3-2 series lead. Now the action shifts back to Texas for game six. The Rockets favored in this one by seven and a half. Payout of minus 115 on the Houston side, minus 105 on the Golden State side. Rick, which side of that spread are you taking, and do you see the Warriors closing out this series on Friday, or are we going to seven? Uh, we're going to seven. Um, they're going to Taylor's home of Houston, and, and, you know, we're not sure the status of Durant, so we're not sure how that's going to affect not only the game but the spread. Uh, for me personally, I wouldn't even touch the spread for this game. Uh, because of the uncertainty of Durant, uh, I think the seven and a half is pretty high, actually. Um, I don't like <laughs> – Houston could go in there and just blow it out, or they can choke and go with state wins by, like, two or three points. You know, so it's like it can go either way. I'm willing to say that I think Houston's going to win this and push it to seven, uh, especially if, you know, Durant's not 100% healthier if he doesn't play or whatever. Um, I would keep an eye on that spread, see how it shifts based on 
any uh, break in Durant news or anything like that. Uh, for me, since I have to pick, I'll go with Houston covering the spread at home. Uh, they're going to survive and they'll live to fight another day in Taylor's hometown. I think the spread probably indicates that uh, Durant's probably not going to play in this game. That just seems pretty large for Golden State, even though they haven't been that convincing the entire playoffs to this point. Um, you know, he has a calf strain. He had this last year, and he missed, I think, seven days with it. So if it is a calf strain, then I can't imagine he plays tomorrow night. They still have that game cushion, so they can still push it to, or push him to seven if they need it, if he's able to play. Um, on the flip side, it's admitted, admittedly tempting to get Golden State as an underdog anytime. Minus 105 against the spread um, is pretty appealing, but I'm with Rick. I think the Rockets know they have to win this. They know they have to win game seven. This is their golden opportunity to do it if Durant's not playing. Um, they're undefeated at home in the playoffs. It just seems like it's all set up to go seven. It's felt like that since they won game three. So um, I may be a little bit of a homer here, but I think I'll take the Rockets to cover. I do also think that this is likely going to go to a seventh game. Uh, I am still under the thought process, as I've said before, that if you can give me the best team in the NBA plus a handful of points, more than just like one or two, where you're not literally just picking them to win or lose, uh, I'm going to take the reigning, you know, back-to-back -back NBA champions. Uh, so I, even if Houston wins, I think that the value on it is that you are looking at getting a team that won last year's championship, won the year before's championship, is likely going to win this year's championship, uh, and you're going to get seven points on top of that. So they could lose by two three-pointers and a free throw, and still you would – pay out on that side. Uh, I think that if we're going to be betting on the spread on that one, even though I think that it's the Houston likely wins this game, I think that I would just have to take Golden State because if you're going to give me that team, the best team in the NBA, and seven points, I'm going to take that. That's just the side I would be on. It, it, it has nothing to do with the fact that I, I think that Houston's going to win. I just I don't think that you might say that Houston's going to win, but I would think that it would be, regardless of Durant's status, I think that to say that Houston is going to win and they're going to win by at least eight, or they're, they're going to win basically by double digits, uh, I think that that's a bit of a stretch for being willing to bet on that. Uh, and if you're also getting the better odds on the minus 105 on the Golden State side of things versus minus 115, like I'm even more on that. You know, reigning champs, We'll be in all likelihood champs again this year uh, to make it a three-peat. Plus seven points with better odds. I don't. I, I could not go against that side. Watch them lose by 20. Watch this them lose by 20. Segment for next week. <laughs> hey, we've got to have content for this show, right? <laughs> I mean, why not be bold? That's the whole point. You know, you don't come here for conservative talking points. So go all we in. We talk about shooting horses on this show. You go this for is, it, Drew. This is your, your one-stop shop for horse death talk. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to rein it all in. We're only, you know, a few minutes into this thing already. I'm just trying to, you know, get us back on track before we get to golf and oh. goes into what, whatever direction he's going to take that. Oh, man. Yeah. Right in the wheelhouse. All right. That is a, uh, a little cut point there. So... Check on Bitcoin. You usually wait until the show's over to check on Bitcoin. I, it's move. There's too much movement going on now. I, I can't wait. Well, that's because it's Bitcoin. <laughs> there's too much movement. If you now looking for a little less movement, I you know you could go with like you know golf. Don't oh, choose. If you hate movement, I have the game for you. There you go. <laughs> Whack the ball. Get in the cart. Whack the ball, get in the cart. The cart's more fun than the golf, I think. Oh, I love going in the golf cart, especially as yeah. a kid. Just, uh, you know, depending on how uh, daring you were being or how hilly the, the course is. I duped some hazard a golf cart before, right into a parked car. <laughs> Never forget it. Did yeah. you hit and run? <laughs> nope, I couldn't even move after that. It was stuck in the side of the car. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Duke's a hazard. Ordeal. 
<laughs> well, it looks like them Rockwell boys are getting themselves in another pickle. How are they going to get out of this one? Come back after the break, find out. <laughs> there you go. Always fun. It's Give Me Props, where we take a look at a handful of prop bets to go over for the week. We started with the NFL last week, and that went well, so let's do it again. Nick Bozo was drafted by the San Francisco 49ers two weeks ago, now plays in the same state as his brother Joey, who plays for the Los Angeles Chargers. Proposed prop bet here is which brother will close out the season with more sacks. Older brother Joey comes in at minus 200, younger brother Nick plus 160. Rick, start with you. You know, it actually was a little bit interesting researching and writing this article um, because they measure up quite well. When you look at their physical traits and what they did at the combines, they're very close to each other. And their production in Ohio State, once again, very close to each other. But since this is going to be his rookie year for Nick Boza, and it's going to be Joey Boza's fourth year, for me, it's no question you got to go with Joey Boza here to have more sex. First of all, he has more NFL experience. Second of all, he's playing on a much better defense than what the 49ers have had. Uh, he's got not only a better secondary, better linebacker play, he's got uh, another pass rusher on the other side in Ingram. Um, Boza will have Buckner and maybe a couple other people, but oh, I'm sorry, Nick. Sorry, they're both Boza. <laughs> I got to be Pacific here. Uh, anyhow, bottom line is this. I think the Chargers are actually going to win the AFC West, and they're going to be a really good team, and a big part of that is because of their defense. Joey Boza, if he's healthy, is going to be a monster. He's going to have double-digit sacks. I don't see Nick having double-digit sacks. Uh, there was another prop bet over under Nick having nine sacks. I still think it will be under that. So I'm taking Joey in this one, even though the betting value isn't that great. But uh, he, it just – everything points to him to win this prop bet. Yeah, Joey's the easy pick just based on his track record. He's topped 10 sacks twice in three seasons. But I think there's value in Nick at plus 160 just because, you know, all it takes is an injury to Joey for oh. Nick to have a pretty clear shot at it. Um, he only played seven games last season, so it's not like he hasn't had injury problems in the past. Uh, Nick was the number two pick for a reason. He's, I think he was the most highly touted defensive prospect in the entire class. San Francisco actually ranked in the top 10 in sacks last year. The Chargers were bottom 10. So, you know, it's not like they can't get to the quarterback even without him. So plus 160, I think I would just take the value on the underdog there since you're not getting much at minus 200 with Joey. So, you know, why not take a shot with Nick and hope he has a slightly better season than Joey? I don't think it's unreasonable to say that. Yeah, I, I like the points that Taylor made on that one where it's it's – the minus 200 especially, because even Rick, you mentioned it, it's just not – there's not a lot there if what the obvious choice would be happens. And, uh, yeah, if there's an injury, that's kind of what you're you're looking at where the younger brother might be able to outdo his older brother, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I – I, I, I got to make a counterpoint to that. that? I have to say this because it's just burning me up inside. Nick wow. missed half the college season with an injury. He's just like his brother, Joey. They both uh, have injuries. They're both injury prone. So a quick correction on that, because he did get hurt early on. And I don't remember at what point in the season he would have come back, could have come back and decided to prepare for the NFL draft. Uh, it was not an injury that kept him out from every game. It kept him out when it knocked him out early. And then he just decided to never come back. Injury uh, prone. It's in the family. It may be, it, 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 I'm not disagreeing that there may be something there and that he or saying that he did not get hurt last year, but it's, uh, I think that to say that they missed the same number of games or a similar number of games, both because of injury, I think is uh, a little bit misleading simply because of the fact that, uh, you know, one chose to sit out, which we've seen from college players in recent years, you know, trying not to throw away millions and millions of dollars to, to do their volunteer service for their university. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, you may as well just take a shot on the underdog. You know, it's the value bet. It's, it's a toss up anyway. So why not? There you go. Well, first overall pick Kyler Murray has a few prop bets available. There's an over under 3,200 yards passing over under 14 and a half interceptions and even over under 475 yards rushing. But here let's focus on passing touchdowns. Over-under set at 19 and a half. Pays at minus 115 on either side. So, Taylor, 
Do you think Kyler Murray can throw 20 touchdowns or more with Arizona this year? I think he can. It all depends on if he plays the you know, requisite number of games. I assume he will begin the year as the starter. The only other quarterback on the roster is Brett Hundley. It's not like Brett Hundley is some seasoned veteran that he's going to really be learning under. So, you know, they traded Josh Rosen out after one year. They risked it by going back-to-back number one picks on this guy. I imagine he's going to start right away. And if he does, uh, he'll have plenty of opportunity to put up numbers. Uh, Baker Mayfield set the rookie record with 27 last year. 19 and a half is pretty middling for a starting quarterback, assuming he gets in all 16 games. Obviously, there's injury risk. He's tiny. (laughs) Anything can happen, but he still has Larry Fitzgerald. Christian Kirk showed last year he's a pretty decent young receiver. Charles Clay is a nice veteran tight end. Rick surely knows him well. (laughs) So I would take the over on 19 and a half. Um, The talent's obviously there. He put up massive numbers last year in college. Um, Even if he's not playing that well, 19 and a half is still an attainable number. So I'd hit the over. I got to agree with my esteemed colleague here, and here's why. He's going to be playing in an offense that's going to be up and down the field, Uh, and they're going to be pushing the ball. They're going to be – they're going to have a lot of plays on offense. He's going to be having plenty of opportunities to throw the ball. Um, Not only that, if you look at some of the rookies last year, if they all played 16 games, I think all of them except Lamar Jackson probably would have gotten over 19 and a half touchdowns. Josh Allen played 11 games, and he was paced to have that. You need, what, 1.25 touchdowns a game to get 20. Uh, If you play 16 games in this league, you have to imagine that defenses will stack the box and make him throw it. That would make sense since he's a rookie. And watch him running the ball because he's probably going to try and run more. Usually rookies that can run, run more in the beginning because they scramble, they get scared of the pressure, whatever. takes time to get used to that speed. He's going to break that. He'll probably end up, I think, like 24, 25 touchdowns um, if he can stay healthy the whole year. That's, that's always the case. That's always the big if, if they can stay healthy. Yeah, I, I, I see no reason why he wouldn't be starting. From, I think Arizona's even come out and said that they didn't draft him that high to have him sit on the bench. And yeah. they just created a top 10 draft pick, a quarterback, to let this guy have the job. I mean, that was the thought before the draft was, okay – you're going to have Josh Rosen and Kyler Murray with a quarterback competition, and then Murray will eventually unseat him or whatever. But Rosen's in Miami, so there's no one he's competing with. It's uh, it's not like Rosen with the Dolphins, where you're where they had signed a guy, uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick, in the off season, where you can legitimately go, well, man, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think that and and twenty seemed high until, like you guys were saying, with those numbers when you look at last year it isn't any longer for a rookie quarterback who's playing at least 13, 14 games to average a touchdown and a half a game. Uh, and I, I, so I, I would take the over on that. I, you know, whether or not it's uh, I, I find it interesting, the interceptions at 14 and a half too, because I, you never know with a rookie quarterback that they could match. Yeah. I mean, over and over, over the rushing yards, over the interceptions, over the passing touchdowns, the only one that I had a problem with was the passing yards. I'm not sure he's going to be able to get, what, a little over 200 passing yards a game. Don't know yet. Don't know his, how accurate he's going to be. Don't know much, how much he's going to run. And like we've been saying, don't know if he's even going to play all 16 games. Yeah. So. Your point about Cliff Kingsbury, though, was really good. Like there, He's going to have ample opportunity. And I think just on the volume alone with all the passes he's going to throw, touchdowns will be there, interceptions will be there. Yeah, Hit the over on both of those for sure. Definitely. And you can find a lot more on these prop bets and more in a couple of great articles by Rick over at gamblingsites.org. Let's stick with football, kind of move to one of Rick's favorite players playing one of Rick's favorite sports. It's the 2019 AT&T Byron Nelson this weekend in Dallas, former Cowboys quarterback, everyone's favorite football analyst, Tony Romo, is in the field. Two prop bets in one here because the first one might be way too easy. Will Tony Romo make the cut? Was at minus 5,000 for no and plus 1,600 for yes ahead of the start of the tournament. Then there's also the question of how many shots will Romo miss the cut by? Over under set at 11, paying minus 115 either way. Rick, I know you're desperate to talk about this, so we'll let you go first. 
is there any alligators or crocodiles at this course? I mean, because that's a prop bet, and I would like to see Tony Romo losing a hand. Anyhow, going on, moving, moving forward. <laughs> you know, he's not making the cut. And the other prop bet, what was, what did you say, over under eleven? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say it's gonna be under eleven. I'm picking eight. So it would be interesting if he got chubsed. Uh, at the event this weekend. I think that would make for some good television. Um, but 11 shots is a lot of shots to uh, miss the cut by. A couple things. Romo is a scratch golfer, allegedly. So, you know, by all accounts, he's a pretty good golfer that should be about even par without a handicap. And this is actually his home course. He's a member of this golf club in Dallas. He's been practicing here, he says, like for well over a year now in preparation for this event. He's not going to make the cut. Uh, plus 1,600 is not even good enough value for me to even consider taking that bet. Um, but I think over under 11, I would just take the under there too. Um, I think he can put up a respectable showing while also finishing dead last. So it's not impossible. Like 11 shots is just a lot to miss the cut by, even if you're not even a pro golfer. You're not uh, – with, with all that information about being a scratch golfer on this exact course for – the, you're, you're not going to put five bucks down for the chance to get, like, what, 80? <sighs> no. No. If I agree plus with you. Plus 5,000, maybe. <laughs> right, yeah. Plus, yeah, plus 1,600, no. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I'm, uh, that's uh, some really good research into Tony Romo's golf career. I, I, I would go the under on the 11, too. Uh, you know, it would be amazing if he did make the cut. He's not going to, but just because we're – if he does, we're leading the show next week with that. Oh, and, my God. You know, we'll just dedicate an entire segment. An entire show, you mean. Yeah. Yeah, uh, to Rick on Roma. Uh, it couldn't be worse. We could be talking about a golfer getting a Presidential Medal of Freedom Award for what? No freaking reason. I am actually a little surprised that Rick didn't say that he was going to miss by nine simply because of the jersey number, but – uh, you were like, you were right there. You were at eight. Uh, but anyway. I was giving him a little credit because he does have a little bit of golf experience. Yeah. So we're, we're all on the under 11 on that point and that he's uh, going to miss the cut. Uh, and I think two of us are really hoping that Romo makes the cut somehow just so we can bring this back up for an hour next week. What if he wins? Plus 10, oh. th or 10,000 to one. There you go. Hey, Rick, how much you putting down on that? <laughs> nothing <laughs> it's not right. the deepest field you know no tiger sure. it's possible well, i mean this is he he could be the tiger woods of this tournament we don't know uh, if if we're going to take a ten thousand to one odds i'll go with ryan newman at kansas this weekend in nascar he's well, won there in the past at least he's made the cut he's qualified well like don't get me started on this well, we will get you started on this, but it'll just be in a little while. We're, we're doing NASCAR okay. in this a little bit. But right now, let's do an NBA prop bet. One that Taylor wrote about recently, that is which team will win the NBA draft lottery. Betting on who will win a literal lottery seems like the most meta thing possible to me. But what are you going, where are you going on this, Taylor? Uh, so the Knicks are the betting favorite at plus 450. They had the worst record in the league this past season. Uh, you have Cleveland plus 500, Phoenix plus 500. Chicago plus 600 and Atlanta plus 700. Um, so the team with the worst record in the NBA has actually won the lottery four years in a row. Um, not that that really has any predictive value whatsoever, but you know, the whole thing with the Knicks, you got Zion this year. He's the big, he's like the biggest prospect since LeBron. The Knicks have been starved to be relevant for decades now, I think. Uh, Patrick Ewing is representing the Knicks at the lottery. Of course, in 1985, there was the whole conspiracy theory with the frozen envelope and David Stern rigging the lottery for the Knicks. So it's kind of all coming together for them. Um, if you're betting on this, you're probably a degenerate in the first place from a betting perspective. So with respect, I would bet on the Knicks here plus 450. But uh, Cleveland uh, won the lottery three out of four years when LeBron was gone last time. Plus 500, they have good lottery luck in their history. So that's not the worst bet, but I'd go with the Knicks. Hey, I'm getting my tinfoil hat out for this one because I've always thought the NBA lottery is a bit of a conspiracy. There's a fix going on backstage. Um, you know, for me, I think it would be hilarious if Phoenix won it this year and they get it back-to-back -back years. 
and they can add uh, Zion with Aiton and, you know, become a great team again. But I think everything for the last, I don't even know how many years now, has been pointing towards the rebuilding of the Knicks, for the Knicks to be a, rel- a relevant um, place where maybe free agents can go to. They're a huge market. Like the NBA needs the Knicks to be a good team. They need that market to be explosive, uh, the fans, everything else. Um, I'm going to say, I, I hate to say it, but I'm going with the Knicks here. I would love Phoenix, so I would love Phoenix. And it's a conspiracy. It's all a conspiracy anyways. I Rather than bringing out the tinfoil hat, I'm just going to say this way as far as it goes, because you were reading off the odds on it. This feels a lot like if I had a coin here on my desk, and I, you know it's a 50-50 shot. You know the exact odds of those numbers coming up. And I said, I'll give you 35% basically like odds, heads or tails. Why would you take that? Like right. you're literally betting on something where you know the exact odds and you're going to get worse odds than if you just went, I mean, this is roulette. Go play, you know, the, the odds that you're going to get, just go play single zero roulette somewhere. You're literally going to end up with better odds that way. You can play red, you can play black, you can play first 12, second, whatever you want to do. You'll find ways to get to match the odds of the NBA teams involved in this uh, somewhere on there uh, in some combination of bets. Uh, and you're, you literally only have that one in 37 chance or two in 37 chance if you find the double zero numbers, uh, of like, you know, worse than true odds. I mean, that's, I, this seems just very odd to me to, to bet on the lottery as opposed to who the lottery, like how many, like, will the player be traded? Cause the NBA is like, Draft pick trading is really odd. Like you could, like that would be more interesting to me, but betting on what amounts to basically a spin of roulette and getting worse odds than if you just went and put it on the roulette board just seems very strange. This is the only, like the only real way you can do it with any rhyme or reason is like what Rick was saying. Like just put on your tinfoil hat and say, you know, if the NBA were to rig it, this would be the year they would do it. You have the Knicks, you know, if they get the number one pick, it's like, well, they had the worst record, so we didn't do anything. They just won the lottery. And it just so happens this is the best prospect since LeBron. So, If I, you know, if I were betting on this besides a conspiracy, I would bet on three teams. I would, I would make three bets with all with, with the, the payout for each one. Because you're taking what, – what is the odds for the Knicks to win it? Like 20% or something like that? 14 for the top three. What's that? I think each of the top three teams has 14% odds. Yeah, it's, it's, so if you bet on the top three, you're getting, what, plus 450, plus 500, plus 600, something like that for those three teams. That's how I would approach it if I was betting on this. Otherwise, it'd be conspiracy theory all the way. Well, everyone loves some easy money. So, Rick, what is your uh, easy money lock of the week? And I'm assuming that there's no tinfoil hat needed for this one. No, there's no tinfoil hat here. But there is a bike helmet on this one. And we'll back, back to the Giro. One of my favorite bets that I've seen out of this whole Grand Tour, um, head-to-head matchup. Simon Yates versus Vincenzo Nibali, the shark of the Messina, but a decade older. His team is not nearly as good as Yates. Yates would have won it last year if it didn't crack on the final stages. He had... The pink jersey, which for those who don't know, is the leader of the race overall, for 13 stages of the 21 stages, he had it. He cracked in the final mountains, lost, went from first to 21st. What happens? He bounced back during the summer. He didn't race the Tour de France, come back, won the third Grand Tour of the year, the Vuelta Esfani, the Tour of Spain, and has said all off season, he's wanted this race. He wanted to come back to the Giro. He wants to win the Giro. They've stacked the team for him. They've put other great riders to support him up the, in the mountains. He's learned his lesson. He's going to pace himself. Head-to-head versus Nibali, who's already won two Giros, who's won the well, who's won the Tour de France. Minus 200 for Yates, plus 150, 160 for Nibali. My money, the lock pick, the easy pick of the week, you have to go with Simon Yates here. He is not only his whole entire team, 
all off season has been focused on this. This is what they're setting out for. Nothing else matters but for him to win the Giro and to rebound from last year's epic collapse. My money's going on Yates to beat Vincenzo Nibali head to head in the Giro. Taylor, what do you got for an easy money pick of the week? Since I'm assuming it's not cycling. Uh, Rick just took the words out of my mouth. But, you know, that was mine and I got nothing now. Um, there's not much as far as easy money right now. Like we're kind of in between with hockey and NBA, kind of transitioning from one round to the next. Uh, we talked about Rockets Warriors. I think this is going seven. So I think Rockets on the money line, minus 340 to win game six. You know, that's, some, that's not something you want to bet on, but if you were crazy enough to want to bet just to bet and win, I guess you could do that. Um, it's easy money, but nothing really stood out to me this week. So I would just take Rick's cycling advice and run for the hills. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, on the opposite of that, it's clear as mud. The game fighter event that seems so unpredictable that we're keeping clear away from betting on it at all. Taylor, what is your pick this week? And are we doing the NHL playoffs for, I think, the fourth week in a row? You are correct. We have uh, St. Louis and San Jose game one this weekend, Saturday evening. Uh, the Sharks just won uh, against uh, Colorado. 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 Correct. Game seven. Uh, Blues won game seven in overtime at home the other night. San Jose is at home. I've been kind of anti San Jose this whole time. I think the Blues at plus 115 is interesting, but, you know the hockey playoffs have been so unpredictable that I don't see how you could bet on this and actually feel confident about it. I would lean uh, toward the blues as underdogs if I were betting on it, but as has been the case for weeks, it's something I would just continue to avoid. It's fun to watch, but you don't need to be betting on it to make it more fun. It's probably less fun if you bet on it, actually. You know, I agree with you on that, but for me, I've got kind of two things that I'm really going to stay away from. And I recommend everybody stay away from. First of all, DJ Penn is fighting again at the UFC this weekend. And my God, he hasn't won in eight years. He's 40 years old. He, he's not even competitive in these fights anymore. I don't even know why the UFC even allows him to fight. And, and for me, I find it sad that he's still fighting, and I'm disgusted with the UFC for allowing it to happen. Staying away from that fight, even though he's one of the, he is the biggest underdog on the entire card against Clay Guida. Staying away from that. And I'm also staying away from Kevin Harvick. The man who won eight races last year is not running well this year. He's finishing in the top fives consistently in top tens, but he's constant or consistently being one of the odds on favorites each week. He's coming to Kansas. Oh, we're probably going to get into NASCAR soon. I can't give it it all away now. I'm staying away from Harvick, and I'm staying away from BJ Penn. Clear as mud. It's that time of the podcast where I could try to impersonate Tom Cruise without it having to do anything with us being similar heights. That is because it is time for <clears throat> Show Me the Money! Lines where we look ahead to this weekend's games and events and their current money lines. Let's talk MMA, UFC 237 on pay-per-view this weekend in Rio. Headlined by Rose Namajunas and Jessica Andrade in the women's strawweight division. Andrade favored at minus 118. Nama Yunus still coming in at minus 102. Rick, who is picking up the win here? You know, this is actually a pretty exciting fight. I, at least I'm excited about it. You have the champ coming down to the visit or the challenger's home country in Brazil. Like, first of all, that in itself, you got to give Rose thumbs up on because she didn't have to do this. What champ goes to the challenger's home country to fight? You don't have, that doesn't happen. It's usually the other way around. Um, and she's the underdog, and she is a vicious woman inside the cage, uh, Nama Junius. I got to tell you this. Like, I'm pretty pumped. It was almost going to be my uh, lock of the week, picking the champ to retain, but I got to give Jessica some credit here because she's got some heavy hands. She's a striker. She's got a, a great uh, top game when she gets them on the ground. Here's the thing. This is why I think Rose is going to win, and this is why I think you should bet on Rose for this, this event. She has the patience, the intelligence to pick her spots, whether it's she's standing up and striking or down on the ground and forcing Jessica to tap out. Um, she can win it standing, 
She can win it on the ground. The only thing she has to do is fight smart. She is a smart fighter. That's why I believe she's going to win. If you can get the champ as the betting underdog here slightly at minus 102, I don't see why you wouldn't just take Nami Yunus there. It seems like it's basically a toss-up, and uh, Andrade, I guess, has the home ring advantage, home octagon advantage, whatever. <laughs> so, you know, just take Nama Yunus. Uh, it's better value. Just listen to Rick on this. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, in the co-main event, it's Jared Cannonier taking on Anderson Silva. Cannonier comes in at minus 125, Silva plus 105. So, Rick, we'll go back to you again. Which side are you going for in this one, and why should Taylor and I just agree with you like we probably will? You know, I'm not excited to see a 44-year-old Anderson Silva fight again. That's just me. However, I'm really hoping, and this is why I'm saying to take Anderson Silva here. First of all, his opponent isn't like some great star he's fighting. Like he's a middle-of-the-pack, light heavyweight, middleweight, wherever he's going to be fighting at. Um, and he's not, other than striking, he's not dangerous. When it all comes down to how well Silva fights. At 44 years old, you have to be concerned that he's going to have some um, stamina issues or he might be a little bit slower. But this is why I'm taking Anderson in this one. First of all, he's the underdog, and so he's going to have some good value coming back on him. Um, but with that said, he's a living legend for the UFC and for MMA as a whole. He's fighting back in his home country of Brazil. That place is going to go bananas for him when he comes out. He'll have the heroes welcome. They'll be screaming for him the entire fight. They will be booing and throwing things at his opponent. And if he wins, which I think everybody wants to see him win in the UFC because it'll be this big feel-good, get the highlight real clip going as that place, they might forget that there's even a main event if he wins. That's how crazy that place is going to be. I wish I could be in Brazil Saturday night if he wins. It'd be a huge party, as Ric Flair used to say, all night long. Woo! It seems hard to win a fight if the fans are throwing stuff at you. So I think I would probably lean towards Silva there. Um, he's the one I've heard of, which helps. Uh, <laughs> plus 105, I guess he has a nine-year age disadvantage. But age is only a number. So I would take Silva at plus 105 because that's what Rick told me to do. Uh <laughs> I do think it's interesting going with uh, with Silva, given his age. Uh, you know, as the underdog, I, I'll, I'm I'm trusting Rick's opinion on this one. Uh, I, other, you know, I, I may have been leaning towards Kenanier until uh, hearing Rick talk. But if Rick's picking Silva, I'm picking Silva. It is, you know, you get to be at they, home too. They need that feel good moment. Yeah. Silva needs it. UFC needs it. Brazil needs it. Taylor needs it. I do desperately need it. <laughs> Well, let's head on over to the NHL Stanley Cup playoffs. We're going to be talking about the series as a whole here, starting with the Eastern Conference Finals. By the time you see this, Game 1 will be in the books, but we're taping this before Game 1 is played. Bruins minus 155 to win the series. Carolina plus 135. Taylor, let's start with you. Which side are you taking for the series? Who's going to the Stanley Cup Final from the East? So there are two conflicting ideas here, one of which is, Betting against the Boston team lately has been kind of a fool's errand, Celtics notwithstanding. Uh, but you have on the other side, the underdog is Carolina. Underdogs have been ruling the NHL playoffs so far for the most part. Uh, Carolina is coming off a sweep of the Islanders, as Drew knows well, uh, while Boston yeah. took six games to dispatch uh, Columbus. So I would just side with the value, which is Carolina plus 135. Um, they're clearly on a roll. They dethroned Washington in seven games. They rode that momentum through the Islanders. You know, Boston's Boston, but I would just bet on value and the values on the Hurricanes. Yeah, I see your point there, but I've been rolling with the Bruins as playoffs. Um, I like their physicality. I like their goal tending. Um, they just dispatched up a tough team. Carolina has been a feel-good story this postseason, but I think that – a little bit of a Cinderella run has got to come to an end. I think Boston's just a better team all around. Taking the Bruins, I'm going to stick with them. Took them before. I'm going to keep riding them all the way to the finals. So Boston has probably the better defense. They've got the better goalie, although the defense and goaltending for Carolina has been fantastic throughout the postseason. Uh, special teams has been huge for the Bruins uh, so far in the playoffs. They are one of the best 
on the power play, one of the best on the penalty kill. Carolina is the worst team that won a first round playoff series on the power play, the worst team that won a first round series on the penalty kill. And the Bruins are the better team. But that hasn't stopped Carolina at any point yet in the playoffs because every time I've looked at their series, I've gone, well, the other team looks like they're better. The other team might have a better coach, like I thought with the Islanders, which we'll get to that because that's definitely the whoops. Uh, you know, I thought that uh, you, know, you look at them and you compare them to Washington. Washington had a better offense. Washington had a better goalie. Washington had a better defense. Didn't matter. It did, just has not mattered. Carolina is just a team. Ever since Don Cherry decided to call them a bunch of jerks, this Carolina team has been like, you know what? Let's make Don Cherry talk about the Hurricanes for as long as humanly possible. Let's make him just sit back. I hope that Carolina wins the cup at home because I just want to see, like, I, I, I enjoy watching Don Cherry because his suits are ridiculous and he's just kind of loud and can be entertaining at times. But, like, I want to see him after Carolina wins the Stanley Cup and whatever celebration they would pull out. Uh, I don't know if they'd have a – they'd have to have something up their sleeve for that. But uh, Carolina – I looked at this series. I was like, you know what? Boston's got them beat here. Boston's got them beat there. But that's been the case for every Carolina series in the playoffs so far. So I'm going with the, the Hurricanes. They're, they're, they got the better value as the betting underdog. And I see no difference between them going up against Boston than I saw with them going up against the Islanders or them going up against the Capitals. And I'm learning my lesson. So, uh, yep. and then of course, this will be the time that that, you know, doesn't end up being the case, but you know, you got to learn your lesson at some point, right? So uh, let's move to the West because in the Western Conference Finals, St. Louis beat Dallas in seven games to move on. San Jose beat Colorado also in seven. The Sharks favored to win the series. They're minus 128 at last check. Blues, the underdogs at plus 108. So Taylor who do you believe is coming out of the West? You got into this a little bit with clear as mud, so I'll let you continue here. Um, I've been against the Sharks pretty much the whole time. They just seem to make everything difficult when it doesn't necessarily have to be. They came back from 3-1 down to beat Vegas. Uh, they took Colorado to seven in the second round. Um, St. Louis has only played one fewer game than them, so it's not like there's a big fatigue advantage for either side here. It's kind of the same as the East, where I'm just going to side slightly with the better value, which would be St. Louis at plus 108. Um, their goaltender has been largely awesome. He had some weak moments during the Dallas series, but it's still something of an advantage, I think. Um, Martin Jones speaks for himself on the other side. I just These teams are really similar. They finished two points apart, I believe, in the regular season standings. San Jose just has home ice, but that hasn't really mattered that much during these playoffs for anybody. So, again, I'm just going to side with the value, and that's the Blues. Hey, I've said it once. I've said it twice. I'll say it a third time. I will never, ever take the San Jose Sharks. Uh, I've been against them for a decade now, at least, and they're in my home state. It is just because they have mastered the art of choking. And you know what? They shouldn't have even pass the Vegas Golden Knights. If it wasn't for the refs who were secret Sharks fans, they wouldn't even be here. <laughs> yes, yes, they beat Colorado, but I think St. Louis is a better team than Colorado. I, th I think Vegas is better than all of them. And, you know, Vegas should be here right now. With that said, I'm sticking with St. Louis. I like their goaltending. I like their physical play also. Um, and I think if this goes seven, I like St. Louis. Um, in the end, I like, I like what they're showing and I like the consistency they've had for most of the playoffs. So, uh, St. Louis and San Jose, uh, entering the series, they're, they're both the teams that I feel that every single year, I always look to one or both of them. And a lot of people do as being like, Oh, this is the year that finally that team gets over the hump because they're always the team that looks like they should be contending for a Stanley cup championship and always has something happen in the playoffs where they just fall off. Uh, you know, San Jose finally got to the Stanley Cup final once. St. Louis hasn't been since, you know, they, they were 12 teams in the NHL. Um, and they basically got into those by default. Uh, so I'm looking at it, I'm going, you compare Bennington for St. Louis to Jones with San Jose, and you could go, okay, Jones since those first four games against Vegas has been really good. and Bennington 
doesn't have a track record that Jones does. So you could put them as a wash and you can go, okay, well, the talent is there for both. The difference for me and the reason I'm picking St. Louis is because the Blues have gotten to this point beating Winnipeg in six uh, and beating Dallas in seven, which I feel is more – as much as it was impressive that San Jose came back against Vegas, it it is one of those things where they they play the entire second round without Joe Pavelski, but they would not have been playing in the second round if Pavelski didn't get hurt. So I'm looking at it from the perspective of – Like, I think that there, even if you go like, okay, it's been equally impressive in the first two rounds, Tarasenko and Shen for the Blues in the regular season combined for 120 points. In the postseason, they have nine. The Blues are in the conference finals, despite two of their three best offensive players doing nothing in the playoffs. And that is the part that I look at and I go, they've got something in the tank that hasn't been seen yet. So if it's equally likely that Bennington or that Jones were to drop off or stay the same or the defenses or the offenses, whatever, the Blues have the wild card. They've won two playoff series without two of their three best players contributing offensively. Uh, So for me, that's the difference makers. I go, okay, they're, I can look at them as the same. They're always the two teams in the West that always should be there, but never are. They're always, you know, they've got, Goaltending that has been really good, but you don't know because they could go either way. You know, Bennington just doesn't have the longevity yet, and Jones is is Martin Jones. Uh, So for me, that's the difference, is that Tarasenko and Shen, if they show up, they haven't yet, and the Blues have still won. So that, for me, is that I'm taking St. Louis because of that. Uh, And I know Rick wanted to get into this, so let's talk NASCAR. Qualifying for Saturday night's race at Kansas Speedway coming up Friday night. So obviously we're taping this ahead of time. Kevin Harvick won this race last year. Kyle Busch, the favorite, betting-wise, at plus 250. Rick, with qualifying still yet to come, who do you like this weekend? And I have a feeling Taylor and I are just going to sit here, nod, and then agree with you. When you're- <laughs> okay, listen, this one's actually kind of tough. This one's a little bit tougher here. Um, and it's because all five of the betting favorites, or the top five at least, have all won at Kansas before. And so that makes it a little more challenging because you can't say, oh, let's rule this guy out because he hasn't won yet at this track. With that said, Harvick tied with Jimmy Johnson and Jeff Gordon for the most career wins at Kansas at three. But like I was saying earlier, I'm staying away from Harvick. I've picked him twice this year to win a race that he's won multiple times at, especially like Phoenix, and he bombed. He hasn't won yet this year. He's barely even cracked the top five. He's usually getting fourth or fifth. So I'm going away from him. I picked uh, Harvick to win last weekend. That's why it's still burning inside. I still feel that burn because he burned me. But I said last weekend, first of all, I don't want to toot my own horn, but toot, toot. I got four of the top five drivers right last weekend. Um, And I said, if Harvick fails at all, the winner is going to come down to Truex or Chase Elliott. Who won? Truex won. So I had a good feel for that. This week, though, this one's a little bit harder. With all of the favorites being so close in terms of their success at the track, it's really going to come down to um, pit stops, caution flags, and then who's the best driver. With that said, when you're talking about the best driver in NASCAR, you, you almost always have to start with Kyle Busch first. Okay? I'm not feeling Joey Logano right now. He's my silent assassin. I always pick him to probably finish top five every week because – He's a really good driver. He's a defending champ. Truex is starting to come on strong. He's won two of the last three or four races. Um, He's looking good. He's won multiple times at Kansas before. Staying away from Harvick. Keselowski's won at Kansas. But Keselowski's had such an inconsistent year that I'm not excited about him right now. If you're going to put me on the spot right now, which you are, I have to side with. Uh, I have to lean towards Kyle Busch. I just think he hasn't won a race in a while. He's the best driver in all of NASCAR. He's leading the series with three wins on the season already. It's been at least a month since his last one. Uh, he's due for a win. Like he, this guy is almost like clockwork, and I think the clock is saying Kyle Busch right now. I see Kyle Busch listed at plus three thirty at my bookie to win this. He's the favorite. Rick knows much more than I do. 
which is not saying much about my knowledge. Uh, I'll just side with Rick. Kyle Bush, plus 330. Well, I, mean, I would like to go back to one thing. We were talking about Tony Romo at his plus 10,000 odds to win the thing. Ryan Newman has won multiple times at Kansas before. He's plus 10,000, okay? He has a, he's my long shot pick of the week. He's my long shot pick almost every week because he's almost always listed at plus 10,000 odds. If you're going to pick between Tony Romo and Ryan Newman, <laughs> who are you going to take here? You go with Newman, okay? Newman. <laughs> We're at the time of the podcast for my favorite segment. That is what we just call whoops. This is our chance to come clean about something we projected, predicted, or pushed that we were really wrong about and to explain ourselves. So I'm going to go first, get us going here. Uh, my conditional whoops from last week, Carolina and the Islanders, that has been solidified. Uh, obviously, the Hurricanes uh, won in a sweep. They won 5-2, 5-2 in the games that were played in Raleigh after winning on Long Island. They gave up, I think it was only five goals in the entire series. Uh, so whoops, because uh, I thought Barry Trotz was going to coach the Islanders past Carolina. But hey, I've learned I'm on the bunch of jerks. Uh, I'm a bandwagon. What was the – Don Terry made some other comment. They've already got another T-shirt printed, a bunch of front-running jerks. So that's available now in their team stores. Uh, I may just have to get one of those because finally I'll just move on to saying I'm, I'm, I'm picking Carolina now. Uh, and then uh, just uh, since that was just a solidified one, Bruins Blue Jackets was a really close series, uh, four to two. Uh, Boston did do a really good job of shutting down the Blue Jackets uh, and ending their momentum because after Columbus scored a power play goal in, I think it was double overtime to win a game, they only gave up one power play goal on the following 13 power play chances Columbus had to close out the series. So uh, I thought after that moment that my pick was, gonna, was going correct with pick, taking Columbus past uh, Boston, but, you know, picking against Boston seems to only go so well. So, uh, and that's just in the NBA. So my whoops is basically confirming uh, Carolina and the Islanders and then just uh, obviously Boston uh, managing to overcome uh, the deficit they found themselves in uh, and the momentum hold that they were in too against Columbus to, to oust them. So that's my whoops. Taylor, what is your whoops of the week this week? So one of my whoopses is ever having doubted the Bucks against the Celtics after one freaking game. I just bought the Kool-Aid, like, you know, Boston stormed into Milwaukee in game one and won by 20 plus points. I was thinking at the time, along with everyone else, like, well, uh, maybe Milwaukee is not really cut out to be a favorite here because they've never been here before. But, you know, we saw them storm back and pretty much dominate from there on out. So I was a whoops forever drinking the Celtics Kool-Aid. And other whoops, I wrote uh, last week that Liverpool has no chance to come back and turn over a 3-0 three, three deficit against Barcelona. They did just that at Anfield. Uh, they are now going to play in the Champions League final against Tottenham Hotspur. So um, I'd say that qualifies as a whoops as well. Although to be fair, you know, teams don't turn over 3-0 deficits against Barcelona. That just doesn't happen. So... Um, you know, I'm not alone here with this whoops thinking Liverpool was done. So my whoops is justified. <laughs> Rick, come oh, clean. Yeah. If you would like to, to justify your own whoopses, uh, you know, go for it. You know, I mentioned Kevin Harwick. I did pick him last week, but I put like an asterisk next to that. And I said, just in case he fails, Truex or Chase Elliott win and Truex won. So I feel like that's not a big whoops, okay? That's not really that big. Uh, Harvick still finished fourth. All right, so it's not that bad. The one that's bad, the one that kept me up at night, the one that makes me not even want to look at myself in the mirror is the Boston Celtics. Like, are you freaking kidding me? Okay. I rode the Celtics. I said not only were they going to win that series, they were going to go to the NBA Finals. They were going to win the Eastern Conference. Celtic pride was back. You know what? It was horrible. They embarrassed every Celtic fan – from young to old, from the East Coast to the West Coast, from all over the world. It was horrible. Kyrie Irving, to quote one of the great boxing movies of all time, Kyrie Irving, he's a bum. He's a bum. Like, Boston needs to get rid of him. I don't care where he goes. He, he, he needs to get out of there. Their coach took the blame and said he did a terrible job at coaching. Well, yeah, he didn't do a great job, but that team shot horribly multiple times in this series like 
Taylor, Drew, and I could get out there and shoot that bad for a fraction of the cost, you know? And we probably would have lost by the same amount of points. Like, I don't even want to say whoops. I, I want to say, like, Boston owes me a part of my life back after that. <laughs> wow. I, I just had to sit back and enjoy that one. That was uh... – Oh yeah, that was. I can just imagine Rick lying in bed, just staring at the ceiling, thinking about the Celtics and how they went wrong. So I was the only one who picked Milwaukee out of the three of us. I picked them to win at the beginning. Yeah, but I whoops doubting them after one game. Yeah. Well, uh, let you know the the window is about to be closed here. One last chance to get some things in. The closing line is set. We're looking for some final thoughts. Rick, uh, I, you just made your, your Celtics rant, uh, but uh, what else do you got for us? You know, I, I briefly talked to you guys a little bit off screen, in between takes, whatever, about this. I'm pumped about the Giro, but I'm even more pumped up for the tour of California, okay? Listen, and now that I found out that my nemesis, my off-bike rival, is going to be within a mile of my house, Come Monday on stage two, when the bike race goes down that street, I, I don't even know what to, I'm going to do with myself. Like, if you were here last fall, how upset and fired up I got about Richie freaking Port. Hashtag, I hate Richie freaking Port. Like, we had everything going, right? Richie freaking Port's going to be here on Monday. He's going to be in California. He's going to be near my home. This is going to be explosive. Putting that aside for a second, the Tour of California is America's uh, top stage race. It's, it's exciting. It's all up and down the state of California, about a week long. It's really taking professional cycling and bringing it to a country that has been kind of behind the times when it comes to the sport. Um, everything usually takes place over in Europe, and that's where the big races are. But this Tour of California is starting to gain some momentum as being one of the better uh, bike races, just period. Uh, there's going to be a lot of big stars here. I plan on being out there for probably the first and second stage since they're both going to be in my region. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I'm waiting for the, the odds to come out because right now most betting sites don't have odds for this race yet. But uh, when they do, you can better believe I'll have a betting guide, a betting preview for this race. But I'm fired up for it. I'm going to be polka dot speedos on Monday. I'm going to be running up and down the street. Woo! <laughs> Uh, Taylor, good luck topping that, uh, but yeah. take it home strong with your closing line. I, there's no way I can top that. Uh, but my bold prediction, which may become a whoops in just a week's time, is that Kevin Durant's going to miss game six. He's going to miss game seven, and the Rockets are going to win both games, storm mm-hmm. their way into the Western Conference Finals. Mm-hmm. They'll play one of these Northwest teams in an unlikely matchup of potential finalists, and they will eventually go to the NBA Finals. So. Golden State's going down. They're losing six. They're losing seven. They're going to get blown out in game six. They might get blown out in game seven. Steph Curry's going to shoot like 30% in both games, questioning his future in this game that we love. So I'll take the Rockets to storm their way into the Western Conference Finals, and we'll see next week if I, uh, if I have to cry about this, which I may. Uh, I'm just keeping the notes, so that's way that uh, you know, I can – Make sure we revisit. Lock it in. Houston wins six and seven. Curry shoots about 30% in both games. Six is a blowout. Seven may be a blowout. What are, we setting, close. What are we setting the minimum number for, to consider a blowout? Ten. Uh, yeah. Like, Double digits? Sure. All right. Yeah. Okay. They're going to close Oracle Arena out in, uh, in style. So we're either going to be uh, – we, we might be leading the show with two things next week. It might just be entirely talking about Tony Romo winning a golf tournament. Uh, and uh, if Houston were to lose or, you know, uh, you know just, we might be talking about that. So uh, I, I might be in jail if I meet up with Richie Port. I mean, we never know. It might just be you two. It might just be me if Houston ends up losing in game six. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the Odds on Favorites podcast. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to the Odds on Favorites YouTube channel. Check out gamblingsites.org for plenty more from these guys here. They've been Taylor Smith and Rick Rockwell. I'm Drew Goldfarb. I will definitely see you next week, hopefully with both of these guys as well.